good morning on this very cold, wintry day. Unfortunately, we can't be together today, and uh, we're sad about that, but we also realize that it's so very important that we take care of our health, our well-being, and make sure that we are safe so that when we can come together, we're able to come together. So uh, we, we thank the elders today for looking out for the well-being of this congregation, and we're praying for one another and hope that we're all in some kind of situation where we're being cared for, and if you're not, I hope that you will reach out to your fellow Christian brother or sister and ask for some help. We are here to encourage one another, to lift one another up, and to help one another. At least that's what the Word of God tells us that we should be doing. I wanted to bring just a short devotional thought today, and as we are still in the beginning of the year, I want to share with you sort of the theme verse that I have for this year, and maybe you too have a theme verse that it's kind of your mantra for this year, something that you're putting at the top that, that as the year goes on, you're thinking, this is how I want my year to go. For me, it is Ezra chapter 7 and verse 10. The Bible says, Now Ezra had dedicated himself to the study of the law of the Lord, to its observance, and to teaching its statutes and judgments in Israel. I think that's a really good verse for all of us, and, and me especially this year, but for all of us, we need to set it in our hearts like Ezra did to study the law of the Lord, to observe it, and to teach it. I love that Ezra was someone who had been skilled in the law of Moses. He did not just happen upon the law. He didn't just happen upon this responsibility. It was something that he had studied for years, but then he came to the understanding that his role, the place that God wanted him to be in, was to be centered around the law of God. You look up in verse 6 of chapter 7. It says, This Ezra is the one who came up from Babylon. He was a scribe who was skilled in the law of Moses, which the Lord God of Israel had given. The king supplied him with everything he requested, for the hand of the Lord his God was on him. Well, don't we all want to say that about ourselves, that the hand of God was on us, that, the, that, that our lives have been touched by God. Over the past couple of days, we have had some hardship in uh, our lives. Maybe your workplace had shut down. Maybe travel was impossible and it was very difficult for you to get where you needed to be. Maybe you had doctor's appointments that were really important that were canceled. Um, maybe it is that that you had a, a job that in order to provide for your family, you had to go to work and it was very dangerous for you to get there or your work shut down and, and weren't able to get there. But I think that uh, even in the most negative of times, even in times like this where we uh, maybe haven't seen some of the things that we're seeing now, uh, I feel like we said something like that a couple of years ago, didn't we? Where we were seeing things then that we had never seen before. Uh, that God has touched our lives that God has uh, given himself to us in such a way that we can be encouraged and strengthened even in very difficult times. God's taking care of us. Uh, all of us have homes to live in. All of us have modern amenities like electricity, heating and air conditioning, vehicles. Uh, they may not be the best, they may not be the newest, but God has allowed us to live in a place where these things are available. And he's allowed us to have a life where we can have these things uh, easily available to us. I think when we stop and think about those things and how the, the hand of God has been on us for quite some time, uh, maybe even our entire lives in one way or another, it, it helps us reflect on those who do not have the things that we have. It is so true that uh, in our own community there are those who do not have homes, who do not have heat, who do not have vehicles or clothing. And my heart breaks for people like that, as I know yours does as well. The reality is that the hand of God can be on them, that God can be with them in working through us. So as we have opportunity to see need and to fulfill that need, the blessings that God has given us should be used to bless others. So, uh, Ezra was someone who had a skill. And what we're going to see in verse 10 is that the skill he had was training in the law of Moses, that, God's, that God was with him, God was upon him, and that Ezra was going to use that combination 
to first strengthen himself and then strengthen others. That's what verse 10 says. Ezra had dedicated himself to study the law of the Lord. I know a lot of people, and I have been very guilty of this, unfortunately, who want to tell other people what to believe about the Bible and who want to, to sound like the authority on the Word without having first studied the Scriptures. Uh, friends, there is a difference between reading the Bible and studying the Bible. And we want to be people who read and study. You can read and not retain anything. But studying the Bible implies that we are looking at the text. We're evaluating the words. We're asking what's going on in the world and, and who is this person that I'm talking about? And what's the situation? And how's God working in that person and in that situation? Ezra first dedicated himself to study the law of the Lord. He knew he had to put the work in before he could receive a return. I have uh, on my wall right here, uh, I'm not going to turn the camera so you can see it, but anyone who wants to come in my office and see it's more than welcome to, a whiteboard. It's very small, and it has a couple of motivational quotes on there, and one of those says, Success is rented, rents due every day. Ezra set in his heart to study the law of the Lord. If we want to be successful Christians, if we want to be like Ezra and be people who have God with us and, and, and have that, uh, that, that level of success, and that may not be the right word, but, but to have that ability to know the word and grow closer to God and develop that relationship, it starts with studying the law of the Lord. It starts with the scriptures. Then, because he studied the law, the second thing is that he was going to observe it. Ezra had dedicated himself to the study of the law of the Lord, to its observance. It is not just enough, or it's not enough to just understand the Bible. We have to put it into practice. We have to be people who live the Word. That's exactly what Paul says in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, when Paul encourages his readers to be living sacrifices, to present your bodies as living sacrifices. Our lives should show God and show other people that we are God's children. In fact, John tells us in 1 John chapter 3 that we are either sons of God or children of God or children of the devil. And I like to say, we all have a daddy. It, it just depends on who it is. Are we children of God? Well, if we're children of God, our lives are going to reflect that. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10 says that we are created in Christ Jesus for good works. James tells us in James chapter 2 that faith without works is dead. Are we observing the law of the Lord? Are we observing the word of God? Are we taking the words of Jesus, the words of the apostles, the, the words of God himself, and putting them into practice in our own lives? It's so easy to point the finger at others and say, oh, look at your sin, look at your sin, look at your sin, and forget that as we point the finger, we have three others pointing back at us. Maybe we should not forget the challenge that... Christ gave in the, the Sermon on the Mount, the very last verse in Matthew chapter 5, when Jesus says, so be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Certainly a tall order, but we do that by first understanding that the blood of Jesus has the ability to make us perfect, and second, by observing the law of the Lord, by observing the words of of scripture by walking in the light as he is in the light 1 John 1 7 so Ezra dedicated himself to study the law of the Lord to observe it and then finally to teach its statutes and judgments in Israel notice that he didn't teach the statutes and judgments until he had first studied them and observed them oh, I love so much what Jesus has to say about this very idea in Matthew chapter 7, as he talks about judging others, he says, get the plank out of your own eye before you get the speck out of your brother's eye. 
I understand both a plank and a speck will cause blindness. But the reality is I cannot perform eye surgery on you if I am walking around blocked with the plank in my eye. So before we go telling others what to do, before we spread the message to others, we have to live it. We have to observe it and study it. But the reality is that once we've done those things, it is expected of us that we will teach others in truth and love, as Paul says our attitude should be. And we should have an attitude of humility, that we should have an attitude of gentleness and self-control, letting all the qualities of the fruit of the Spirit be evident in our lives, Galatians chapter 5. But we're expected to teach. And notice this, that, that he taught its statutes and judgments in Israel. He taught them to people who should have known them. But in this case, in Ezra's case, they had forgotten. They needed reminded. It is the case with us that maybe we study the law of the Lord and try our best to observe it however we can in the best way possible. Maybe the reality is we need a reminder. That's why it's so important that we come to Bible study, that we come to worship service, that we're together. I know today we can't be, but it's so very important that we do those things because we need a reminder. We need to grow in our knowledge of Jesus Christ, as Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 18 says. As the Hebrews author says, we, we too are like his audience where, unfortunately, some of us are still taking in the milk of the word like a newborn baby when we should be taking in the meat of the word and being teachers ourselves. It's a high standard. To be a teacher. James tells us that teachers will be held to a higher standard, that we will be held accountable for the things that we teach. So we need to make sure that what we teach is right and accurate. And that's why we study and observe. I think this is such a great way to, to start the year, to have that mantra. And that's the one that I've adopted. I wonder which ones you've adopted. What's your mantra for the year? Uh, are you going to be someone who dedicates yourself to study the law of the Lord, to observe it, and then once we've done those things, to teach it? I hope you are. I hope, too, that if there's someone listening to this uh, who realizes that I'm not anywhere near where I need to be with my walk with God, that maybe you have become a Christian and you've not been studying the Word, you've not been observing the word. You've not been growing enough to where you can teach others and fulfill that great commission that Jesus gives before his ascension into heaven. If that's the case, I'd love to talk to you. I'd love to pray with you. I'd love to have others like our elders and other ministers and our deacons and, and our strong Christians gather around you, not in condemnation, but in love. To say we love you and we want you to be a strong Christian. Now, maybe it is that you've never started your walk with God. I imagine that since this is going out all over the World Wide Web, there's probably someone listening to this who has not started their walk with God, who has not said, I believe Jesus is the Son of God and I'm willing to be baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of my sins and live a repented and changed life. Maybe there's someone who believes that and who wants to do that. And if that's you, Now's the time. Don't let snow, don't let ice stop you. Of course, we want to be careful, we want to be safe. But we also know that the salvation of our souls is the single most important thing in this entire world. So whatever the case is today, I hope that you, like Ezra, will set in your heart to study the law of the Lord, to observe it, and to teach it. May God bless you. And I hope you all stay, stay safe and war. I'd like us to share in a quick devotional thought before we partake of communion together. I'll pray for the bread, and then we can pause and partake of that bread. I mean, pause the video and do that, and then we can partake of the fruit of the vine after I've prayed for that, and again, you can pause the video and do that. You don't get too far into Genesis before you find the first messianic prophecy. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15 says, 
and I will put hostility between you and the woman, God here is talking to the serpent, between your offspring and her offspring, he will strike your head and you will strike his heel. And many commentators have understood this to obviously be a reference to Jesus, the Savior who would, in his resurrection, defeat Satan. And because, because of, of the temptation, because of the sin of Adam and Eve that came through the temptation of the serpent figure in Genesis chapter 3, death entered the world. Jesus would be the first to truly conquer death. Now, there are others in the Old Testament who would be raised from the dead, but they would all have to die again. Jesus conquers death because Jesus never has to die again. He raised from the dead to live forevermore. And so, this passage of Jesus being the one who would come to strike the head of the serpent, to put to death the serpent, to make him inoperable, is a promise from the earliest of times. We see that happen in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And as we partake of this bread, I want to remember that as Jesus came into this world, he came as a human being. He came into this world the same way you and I came into this world. He was born of woman. And it's that prophecy in Genesis 3 that speaks of putting uh, uh, hostility between the serpent and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. This bread is a reminder that as Jesus lived, he was tempted in all ways we are. He lived life like a human being. And that's a reminder to us that he can and does sympathize with our struggles. Would you pray with me as we pray for the bread? Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this day. We thank you for this emblem that represents the body of Jesus we pray, Lord, that as we partake of it, we would be reminded of his life, that he came into this world like we all did, that he lived a perfect life, even as a tempted human being. We pray, Lord, that as we do this, we will be encouraged, that we'll remember that it was that body that hung on the cross that endured the pain and suffering for us. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now let's pray for the cup. Father, we are thankful for the blood of Jesus. It's the blood that cleanses us from all sin, the blood that ran down that cross that, that covers us and not only covers us but takes away the sins that we have. Father, we pray that as we take this cup, that we would do so in a way that's pleasing to you, that we would search our hearts and clear our minds, and that as we take this cup, we would be reminded and encouraged to know that you loved us so much that you sent your Son to, to die for us, to endure that, and, and that the blood that he shed cleanses us from all sin. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.